first of all, we were very honored that we have really agreed that the evangelical, the evangelical church in Rhineland and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, we could together, you know, hold a conference on Exodus. And uh, um, uh, we planned it for more than one year. And of course, the first time we could, didn't succeed, succeed to hold it in November, not because of a lack of will, but because of Gaza war. And so we had to postpone it uh, to the spring. And of course, we invited some scholars from the United States, uh, some scholars from Africa. Uh, we invited also from Germany, from the Church of Rhineland, key people, and from my church. And I think uh, the, th the theme, Exodus, is a very important you know, one. Usually, you know, uh, uh, the theme of Exodus is a theme which can be taken in any context in the world. I mean, the liberation theology took it, you know. Even uh, feminist theology has taken the story of, of Exodus. But many times also, the story of Exodus was problematic in the life, you see, of Palestinian Christians, because they considered it as the beginning of the colonialism in the country. And this is the reason when you take the issue of Exodus and you come into dialogue with our with our partner church, the Church of Rhineland, and with the Jewish, you know, uh, participants. So you are taking it from another perspective. And uh, to see that the, Oxid the Exodus is a book and is a story of every human being, of every human being who is really under oppression. God calls, God hears the calls God hears the calls and the prayers of the oppressed, whoever they are, from any nationality where they are. And that is really very essential. So, for me, the conference was very deep because neither our Jewish participants, nor us, nor the German participants, we came to speak, you know, on a shallow way, just really for courtesy reason. We came with the pain of our people under our skin. And we have heard the German story. We have heard also the, the Jewish narrative. And we have heard also the Palestinian narrative. And it was very interesting when some even, you know, uh, Jewish participants said, we cannot discuss today the Exodus without taking the context of the occupation. And I think, you know, this gives you to understand that in the depth of human being, there is a yearning for peace, a yearning for justice, a yearning for reconciliation. Politics can play its own you know, games. But at the end of the day, how can we live together? How can Muslims, Christians, and Jews, Palestinians, and Israelis live together? And how can we see the Exodus, not a story of colonialism, but a story of liberation, that we can really uh, be all liberated and see the image of God in the other? and mutually accept the humanity of the other, and mutually recognize each other's human, civil, religious, political, um, uh, and national rights. I think, you know, that is very meaningful, uh, meaningful. And it's our call as a church to bring these points always to the fore. I mean, it's easy to speak on everyday problems which we are facing, which are very deep. It's easy to speak on violation of human rights. And I can tell you many stories. I mean, um, we spoke even in the on the wall. The wall is, we don't want, I mean, the wall is, you know, a pain 
For us, it's a pain. Because it's not only separates us, but I, it comes, you know, in a way which I don't want to know. People do not want to know anything about the others who are behind the wall. The Israelis do not want to know anything about the others behind them. And the Palestinians do not want to know anything about the other who is the Israeli. So it's not only a physical, you know, separation, it's also mental. And how can we build peace if, there is, if, if this war cannot go out? We want to, uh, we, we want really to break down any wall and to build, 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 build bridges between human beings, uh, between Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, after all, we have to live together in two state solution, living side by side, you see, um, uh, on 1967 voters. We have to share Jerusalem for the two nations and the three religions. I think, you know, there is no other option. And why should we give time, you see, just to prolong it and prolong it and postpone it? Why don't we give hope in a hopeless situation for our peoples now? I think that is the challenge which this conference has brought to us. But some people may say, oh, maybe you are people, a small group who are speaking. Yeah, but you know, don't underestimate you know, the impact of such a conference, the impact, you know, uh, that this conference will leave in Palestinians and Israelis and Jews and Christians and Germans and how we can build really a kind of a fellowship together, you see. I mean, we, I was very happy that uh, during the conference, even Jewish participants, not only the Germans and the internationals went to Ramallah to see one to see one of our success, successful schools, the School of Hope, and they were with the students, and they have seen the hope in Muslim and Christian students studying together in the Lutheran school. This is remarkable. Education is the only transformative power. And you know why is it? Because Israeli Jews are not allowed to enter to the West Bank. So when they really went on the bus with us and we went together to see one of our schools, this is very meaningful. So I think this is also a part of the Exodus. Well, I think, you know, uh, we decided together, you see, that we will have another conference next year another workshop, because we found out that this workshop was successful. Um, and we thought that what themes should we take for the future? And we found that there are two important themes. One is land. I mean, you know that the EKD has developed you know, a study on the land. And we know that it is now distributed among German churches to study it. But it's also important that the German churches hear what Palestinian churches have to offer also to the understanding of the land. Um, and I think it will make it then a comprehensive picture when you hear also our point, and when we hear also the Jewish point of view. And I think, you know, we are still in the stage of taking, what theme should we take? Because, you know, land, promised land, and all these things are not easy theological issues. But at the end of the day, I'm living in the land. What does the land mean for me as a Palestinian Christian? Uh, and as a, as a Palestinian in general, what does it mean for me? So we are taking these themes in order to find our different point of views, but also to find out
can be developed out of these different point of views, which can be biblical and which can be existential. You know, a way forward, a common way. And I think we, we are on this stage of planning. The second thing is water. You know that one of the solutions should be the water because maybe some say that the next war in the Middle East will be on water. And especially this country which has very limited resources of water. And also the water is part of the injustice in the country. So how can we share equally the water? And this is the reason we are taking these two subjects, land and water. I know they are big ones, but they are very essential that we discuss. And the more you dialogue, the more you find solutions. And that is my own way of thinking. But the more you don't want to dialogue, the more you want to live in your own prison. No, we have to get to how to dialogue and to challenge each other for the sake of humanity. I think what I would just say very shortly, that I'm happy that the, Rhine, the Church of Rhineland is taking us as a partner in Jewish dialogue. Because it makes it, you know, comprehensive. Not only to see it from a German perspective, which is justifiable, but also to see it from other perspective. And from the perspective of a Palestinian, maybe we Palestinian Christians do not have the same agenda. But at the same time, but at the same time, it's very important that we as two Christian churches, sister churches, who are close with each other. After all, we are the outcome of a German mission, of the mission of the German churches. So how can we as the closest church to the German churches and to the Church of Rhineland, how can we have together a vision for a Jewish Christian dialogue? and even a Jewish-Christian-Muslim dialogue in the future. I think it's very essential. Today, no church can be independent. In a globalized world, we are all interdependent. We are living in a fragmented world. If we don't join forces for the sake of mission, holistic mission, and diakonia, and dialogue with other religions, the church will no more be prophetic. The church prophecy is when we work together in a communion for the sake of every human being. I want to tell you, you know, uh, for me, uh, for me, I have always dialogued with Jews. And I even initiated a group called Jonah Group in 1991. Why did I really have it? In 19, because prior to that, the first time we met with the Jews in dialogue was in Sweden, not in Jerusalem. That was strange for me. I should travel to Sweden and uh, uh, Israeli Jews should travel to, to Sweden to meet me and dialogue, how can we live together? And I said, okay, the Western agenda is different than ours. Let's have our own agenda. So I found some partners, like, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, Rabbi Ron Kronish and others, whom we together started to speak, what about meeting? rabbis from the conservative, from the reform and orthodox, and not only Lutheran, orthodox, Armenian, uh, uh, Roman Catholic, and together, first of all, search our Bible, know our traditions from our Bible, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible for the Jews, and the New Testament. And we have had really 
very good, deep discussions. For example, what does it mean to be elected nation? What about the land? What about, is there, you know, self-defense in the Bible? Uh, we spoke about, you know, Jewish festivities, how to understand them. We spoke on Christian feasts, how to understand them. And even we visited each other on Christmas, on Easter, on, uh, uh, on the Sukkot, on uh, uh, Pesach. On, we had, we had uh, Seder evenings with each other. You know, what is very important in this matter, you have to understand the other, and especially the other, the other beliefs. And when you learn these things, you start to understand your tradition better. You start to understand yourself better because when you dialogue, you are challenged. And when you are challenged, you start to know, you know your faith and seek into your faith and get deeper into your faith much more. So I think what was very important you know, with these dialogue groups, it's not only it was intellectual, also, we grew friendship, we grew up trust. And for me, that is very meaningful. I think, you know, I think our church is a church which is open to dialogue with the Jewish faith in order that we can really find out how can we help in the country both with the Muslims to have a just coexistence together. But at the same time, you see, we have no problem to dial also with the Israelis to find, you know, how can, as a Christian church, you know, be brokers of justice, instruments of peace, and ministers of reconciliation uh, in, 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 the, in, in the country in which we are living. Because what's going on today is abnormal. Unfortunately, it's becoming normal. The abnormality in that country will create only hatred and extremism. And only we can overcome it, come it by interfaith dialogue, by education, and by bringing justice and peace to the country, which is for the sake of Palestinians and Israelis alike. In 2005, we have created, you know, the Council of Religious Institutions in the Holy Land, which is composed of the two chief rabbis of Israel, the, the, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi, and the heads of churches in Jerusalem, especially Orthodox, Lutherans, Roman Catholics, Armenian, and Anglicans. And, uh, uh, and thirdly, the chief judge of the Islamic court in Ramallah, and the Palestinian Authority, and the minister of, of religious endowment in the Palestinian Authority. And what we have done together, first of all, we have built, you know, a trust among ourselves that we can speak together. Secondly, we have monitored what imams, rabbis, and clergy depict the other. And unfortunately, sometimes the problem starts from us. Clergy, imams, and rabbis. We don't depict the other as they want to be depicted. And we have really tackled that, especially on the communication. And we try to do it, of course we cannot. Thirdly, which was very important, we are now monitoring any kind of attacks or atrocities on holy places. And it's very shameful 
that this year, 22 atrocities against churches, mosques, and synagogues were in Israel and in Palestine. And last week, when we met as a Council of Religious Institutions in the Holy, we condemned it and asked the authorities, don't use religion for political reasons. Don't allow extremists, you know, to kidnap the issue of peace and justice. And we ask them to really take measures against whoever they are. Because extremism is not the monopoly of one religion. There are Jewish extremists, there are Muslim extremists, and there are, um, there are also Christian extremists. So this is the reason the authorities, both in Israel and Palestine, must take measures against anybody who is trying to, to attack other religion for political reasons. And the last thing which we have done recently, which is very meaningful, we have monitored 700 textbooks in Palestine and Israel, how they depict the other. And after two study, two years study, through Yale University, with a team from uh, Palestine and Israel, and and, uh, and from Germany and United States, with Yale University in United States, we got the results. The results are very worrying. First of all, you know, it's very important to say that, sorry, for sure there are two conflicting narratives. And you cannot change them. Because this is history. But how can we teach our conflicting stories, but at the same time find a common future for justice and peace? This is the challenge. Second, we have found out that Israeli textbooks are not teaching enough on Christianity and Judaism. And Palestinian textbooks are not teaching enough on Christianity or Judaism. So, Israeli textbooks do not teach on, on uh, uh, Christian and Islam. Sorry, and Islam. Sorry, I made a mistake, and Islam. And the other. So, I mean, the, the third, second, the, the third thing, the value of coexistence, which the religious tradition is giving us, is missing, is not enough. And fourthly, Jerusalem in textbooks are seen as exclusive for one religion and one nation. And our role as religious leaders is to teach what World Council of Churches, what Lutheran World Federation, what, uh, what uh, um, the heads of churches of Jerusalem are saying, Jerusalem must be for the three religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and for Palestinians and Israelis. I hope that this study will really help us as Council of Religious Institutions, which is a very high level, to take these textbooks to the ministers of education, both in Palestine and Israel, and to ask them to change accordingly. Because if we start with our children teaching them what is right, then we have put the train of reconciliation and justice on the right train. The relation between the Church of Rhineland and my church is long-standing. Unfortunately, there were some years that we didn't have enough contacts together. And, uh, and luckily, we again found each other. And what, of course, I want really, of course, we as a Christian church, in, 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 uh, in, in our part of the world, we need to be in partnership with the Church of Ireland. And we need really to continue that partnership in order to find together, you know, how God calls us together, you know, uh, in, in the Church of Ireland and in the ELCJHL. 
I think we can learn from each other's spirituality. How can you be a Christian in Germany? And how can you be a Christian in Palestine or Jordan and in Israel? I think that is very meaningful to learn it from each other. Secondly, we have to find out together really how we can support each other and pray for each other. What can we really, what projects can we find in order to, to support each other of common, of common interest, not for the sake of only having a partnership, but because partnership strengthens, especially, you know, Christians living in the Middle East. Today, the Christians in the Middle East asking their partners in the world, please don't leave us alone. Our mission is yours. You see, um, uh, the difficulties are not easy. Please help us in education. Help us in, in supporting our ecclesiastical, our mission, our ecclesiastical work. And that is very meaningful today because you, you see what's going in the Arab world, what's going today, you know, extreme, it's our call today, you know, our evangelical call to transform extremism to moderation. That's the role of the church in the Middle East. And how can we, the church of Ryland, work together?